My name is Marek Vašer, and today I'm going to talk about doing the U-Boot bootloader port uh, right with all the latest features. Um, just briefly about me, uh, I work as a software engineer contractor. Um, I'm one of the maintainers in the U-Boot project. I, in that project, I work on uh, USB, a uh, couple of SOC ports, uh, this uh, IntelliX scale, um, the Renesas uh, Arcar, and uh, Alter also get PGA, that's what I maintain. Uh, I also do some sort of work on the Linux kernel and open and beat it, and I'm an FPGA hobbyist. So uh, in case you have interest in any of these topics, please talk to me after this, and uh, tomorrow um, I'm happy to discuss that stuff. Now, uh, I decided to split this talk into multiple sections. First of all, if you have no idea what U-Boot is, uh, I would like to show you what that is and what it's capable of. Uh, once we get through that, I would like to do a brief news flash, uh, just to sync people up uh, who did U-Boot ports uh, before, to, to tell them like what's new and, and so on very quickly. And once we get through that, I'll go through the basics like building U-Boot uh, from source, uh, the structure of the U-Boot directory tree, um, this sort of stuff, so the basic things. Uh, then I'll, I would like to look into device tree control and U-Boot driver model. And once we go through these uh, fundamental things, uh, I will go into uh, doing U-Boot port, uh, because you will have all the knowledge at that point to actually uh, do a basic U-Boot port. Now, uh, since enabling all that stuff uh, will probably make U-Boot grow up a, quite a bit, um, uh, we'll talk about shrinking U-Boot size at the end. So that's, that's what this talk is going to be about. <coughs> so uh, first of all, U-Boot bootloader, what is it? Well. Um, so a bootloader is a piece of code which is running super early on on your platform, and it's responsible for initializing the platform only enough so it is capable of loading uh, the next stage, which in case of a bootloader is usually an operating system kernel, uh, into memory and starting that next stage. And this is what U-Boot can do. It can behave as a bootloader, but it can also behave as uh, much more. It can behave as a boot monitor. That means it gives you a shell, and it can behave uh, as a debug tool. So you can fiddle around with memory. You can operate buses. Uh, you can access USB, I2C, SPI, uh, storage, SATA, you know, this sort of stuff. All that uh, you can do with U-Boot. So it's a really powerful tool. Now, uh, here is an example of a uh, slightly older version of U-Boot. Actually, this is two releases old. Uh, but the sort of printout you get uh, when you start a system which has U-Boot on it doesn't really change. Uh, what you can see here is uh, U-Boot 2017.11. Actually, a new version 2018.03 was released uh, yesterday with, uh, again, some improvements. Now, uh, what else you see in this printout is uh, CPU, uh, type of the board, um, some sort of RAM, some sort of flash, this sort of stuff. Uh, we have also Ethernet, uh, and ultimately we reach the uh, boot monitor prompt where I'm dumping memory. So this is just an example of showing you that you can do a lot of stuff with U-Boot and how it looks when you power up a system which contains U-Boot. Now, uh, if you're asking for some sort of help online about U-Boot, uh, I, especially on IRC and in the mailing list, uh, it's really convenient if you include the U-Boot version at least, uh, which CPU it is and which port it is in the report. It makes it much easier for the U-Boot developers to help you out. Because if you don't do that, then the, the next question will be which version, which port, which CPU. And this is all conveniently like here in, in this printout. You can just like copy paste that into your email and be done with it. It will make uh, our life much easier. So that's what uh, U-Boot is about. And now, uh, <clears throat> very quickly about news in U-Boot. Um, we are progressing in uh, converting U-Boot to uh, driver, uh, device tree control and driver model. That is, we are moving away from the old hard coding everything into a binary to a much more flexible model of just supplying a device tree and uh, having uh, significantly better drivers in U-Boot. Uh, I'll talk about that in detail in a bit. Uh, we recently got uh, FE support. That means U-Boot can behave as an FE uh, library and provide uh, FE services to, for example, Grub. 
So then you can kind of start an FE application like Grub, which is using this uh, FE protocol to talk to U-Boot and consume services like serial port access, uh, block access, network access, that sort of stuff, which I believe might be interesting, especially for uh, distro people. Uh, we also have uh, distro boot command support, which is a sort of a predecessor of that. Uh, it's just a standard U-Boot environment, which uh, in case you are rolling out some sort of development kit, you should enable. Uh, it allows it again. Uh, it lets distros uh, expect something from the U-Boot environment, some sort of standard, uh, and they can tap into it. And it's, again, much easier for the distro people. <coughs> now. Um, we recently got uh, support for applying device tree overlays, and this is a bit of a tool for uh, circumventing the current situation with device tree overlays loading in Linux. Uh, so what basically happens in Linux is that uh, the device tree overlay support is all there, but the configfs uh, device tree overlay lo loader is not there. Uh, so it kind of got moved into U-Boot, and U-Boot is able to take device tree, apply device tree overlays uh, on top of that device tree and pass that to Linux instead. So you do not have to patch your kernel with the config of a loader. <coughs> now, even more recently, we got support for uh, applying device trees overlays through uh, the U-Boot fit image. Um, if this tells you nothing, um, it's probably not your sort of niche, and uh, you don't really have to care about that. So it doesn't have to stress you if you don't understand what I just said. Um, and if you're interested in that, we can talk about it later, but it's unrelated to this talk, so. Yeah. <clears throat> um, one last thing I want to talk about uh, is that we now use uh, Travis CI to do continuous integration on U-Boot, and you can also do that uh, yourself if you're submitting patches, just get a GitHub account, uh, enable Travis CI. The U-Boot sources now contain a Travis.iml file, so when you push it to uh, GitHub, it will just run the entire U-Boot source tree, and it will build it for multiple architectures just to make sure that your patch didn't break anything. It's really convenient, this sort of stuff. And uh, it also makes it easier for you so you don't have to like grab all the tool chains. You can just use the uh, Travis CI nowadays. So that's it for uh, the U-Boot news. <coughs> now um, let's get to uh, building U-Boot. So if you want to build U-Boot, uh, you obviously need to get the sources from somewhere. Uh, the master U-Boot repo is available um, through Git at this, at this address. It's also available through HTTP, so you can get it from there. If you also need uh, tarballs, then they are available again there. Uh, it can just so happen that you are developing some sort of feature and you're probably talking to uh, one of the maintainers of the subsystems, um, at which point they may tell you, okay, so I have this uh, stuff on which I would like you to base your new feature on and it's available in my uh, maintainer repo, so the maintainer repos are available in this, in this second address. Usually you're not gonna need it, but anyways, it's, uh, that's what it is. So once you have the U-Boot sources, you probably want to build them, and to build the U-Boot sources, use the following method. Uh, so just change into the U-Boot source directory, uh, export these two uh, variables, um, the first one selects the architecture for which you are building. So in case you are building, for example, for ARM, this will be ARC equals ARM. Uh, the other one is your cross-compiler toolchain prefix. Um, for ARM, this will be something like ARM Linux dash, something like that. For MIPS, it's gonna be like MIPS known or MIPS Linux, whatever, this sort of thing. Um, now, once you have the environment set up, uh, you need to configure the U-Boot sources. Um, and for that, you need a supported configuration which you can locate under the configs directory. Uh, once you locate your configuration for your board, do you like make your board dev config, the U-Boot sources will get configured, and then use make to compile it. It will produce uh, some sort of binary which you can then install on your system. Um, there is one more uh, detail to this. Um, you can now compile U-Boot as an user space Linux application with the sandbox dev config, at which point you do not need to export any of the Arch and cross-compile options. You just do like make sandbox dev config and make, and it will generate U-Boot uh, elf binaries, a Linux application which you can then launch, and it will give you a U-Boot shell. So if you want to play around with U-Boot shell without having uh, 
any sort of development kit, you can do that with the sandbox. Okay. Now, if you want to add any sort of stuff into the U-boot or if you want to hack on it, um, it's probably a good idea to know the directory structure of the U-boot uh, source tree. It actually is designed in such a way that it matches Linux kernel for the most part. So the Arch-specific um, Arch stuff is in Arch directory, um, in Arch slash something like ARM or MIPS, whatever, are the uh, um, CPU-specific things. Uh, if you have uh, some sort of CPU vendor, then it goes into Mac foo here. Um, unlike Linux, the device tree source files are in Arch slash whatever slash DTS directly. It's not in ARM slash whatever slash boot. So that's a small difference there. Um, we have uh, board support in the uh, board directory, which you won't find in the, in the Linux kernel tree. And then uh, the rest is very similar. So uh, configs contain uh, kconfigized uh, uh, board uh, dev configs. Uh, the thing is, we are still in the process of migrating to kconfig, so you'll find a couple of legacy config options in uh, include slash config still. Uh, this might be this sort of duality might be a little confusing, but anyways, uh, <coughs> Git grab will uh, give you an idea where either of these is. Now we have drivers and drivers. Um, you would uh, shell commands implementation is in CMD nowadays. Um, common code is in common lib, uh, networking stack is in net, and file system code is in fs. It kind of <coughs> um, is logically organized like so. Uh, you will also notice that if you look into the uBoot sources, there's a lot of kconfig and uh, kbuild make files. So yeah, uBoot is nowadays migrating toward uh, kconfig and kbuild. Uh, it's still kind of in progress, but uh, we are just trying to move over. And that's why you still have a couple of uh, config options which are not converted in include configs, unfortunately. But uh, any new uBoot config options are kconfig only. Um, if you have some option which is not kconfig only, you can verify that it's still not been converted uh, by looking into this file. But if you're submitting any, any sort of new stuff, it has to be kconfig only. <coughs> now, uh, to give you an idea how such a kconfig config option looks like, I just pulled out uh, driversnet kconfig here. Um, so in this file, we have a dmeth config option. If you like to make menu config, you would be able to find this in the menu config output. Um, so this option enables driver model for Ethernet. Um, the entry is of type bool. Um, if you look it up in like make menu config, you will be able to locate this sort of line in there. Um, this specific uh, config option depends on driver model, and uh, you'll be able to like list out this sort of help in the, uh, again, for example, make menu config. So this is all similar to the Linux kernel. You can find it uh, all there. Now, uh, there is this uh, sort of small weird quirk in that if you add a kconfig option, it will not have the config underscore prefix in the kconfig file, but in the make files, it is all used with uh, the config underscore prefix. And even if you look into your like kconfig dot config file, it will be with the config underscore prefix. So this is a little bit inconsistent, but um, that's how the uh, kconfig system is. <laughs> this is something you should probably be careful about. Uh, now, if you decide to add a new config option into U-Boot, um, it's just a matter of adding it into the kconfig or adding the matching kconfig entry into the, the right file. If you have any sources attached to that, modify the make file, add the sources. Um, it's that easy. Uh, except uh, in case it's uh, some sort of hardware configuration option, then you should not add it into the kconfig, but instead you should add it into uh, device tree. Now, um, what is a device tree? Uh, just a survey. How many of you know what a device tree is? Just double check that. Okay, that's amazing. Yay, super. Uh, but anyway, just for the record, a uh, device tree is um, data structure which is used to describe hardware to the software. And it's especially useful if your hardware cannot be detected 
then you can describe all the entire hardware structure in the device tree and pass this information to the software, and the software will know the topology of your hardware. Now, um, this uh, device tree has, is a standard and has been around since a uh, very long time. It is actually governed by the e-paper, and if you want to find more information about it, uh, take a look at uh, device3.org website. Um, this is what, it, what the latest information are. Uh, formally, the device tree is a uh, tree-like structure uh, which has uh, nodes in it, and each node can have multiple nodes underneath that, or it can have uh, key value pairs, uh, device tree properties. Now, instead of describing it elaborately like so, I can just give you an example which I pulled out from U-Boot. And in fact, since device tree is a standard, both U-Boot and Linux uh, share the same device tree sources, which uh, is the way it's supposed to be. So if you look at the device tree sources, um, you will see stuff like this. Um, in this particular example, there is this include directive, which uh, is a special detail of U-Boot, Linux, and so on, uh, because these projects run the device tree sources before they do anything with them uh, through the C preprocessor just to expand um, macros like, uh, what do we have here? Uh, like the IRQ type level high and so on. So you don't have to encode raw numbers into the device tree source, but you can just use these symbolic names. So that's what happens first. And after that, uh, what do we have here? So here is the root node. Here are a couple of device tree properties which say, OK, yeah, this is some sort of board. It's compatible with something. Then we have a CPU node here describing the CPU, um, which again is compatible with something. There are a couple of uh, properties attached to that CPU node. And uh, we have a PMU and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a small detail in here which is called the p-handle and allows you to reference different nodes within the device tree. So it's referencing the um, CPU code there. And this makes it more of a graph than actually a tree. So device tree is kind of not really a tree, but it's tree-like structure still. All right. And uh, this can be used to describe the entire hardware topology to the software. Now, you would use this device tree in two ways. Um, so first of all, if your platform is device tree capable and your Linux, is devi or Linux kernel is device tree capable, you would is able to pass device tree to the Linux kernel. And while doing so, it actually does some modifications to the device tree, like uh, it looks up the aliases node and uh, patches, for example, a MAC address into the device tree uh, from the U-Boot environment, which allows you to share the same MAC address between U-Boot and Linux. So this is what happens. But uh, this is kind of boring, right? Uh, the other way U-Boot can use device tree is it can set up device tree access very early on in the U-Boot boot process, and then U-Boot extracts the, the hardware topology from the device tree. And this is governed by the uh, config OF control U-Boot configuration option. But uh, for you to appreciate when the device tree access uh, becomes available, like how early on it becomes available, um, we should take a look at the uh, U-Boot early stages and how it actually boots up. <coughs> so um, when you power on your platform and it does its power sequencing and stuff, um, the CPU will start executing some code at the reset vector, which is likely usually U-Boot. Now, uh, the code which it will start executing lives somewhere in the ARC directory, and it's a piece of code which is uh, architecture-specific. And it's not generic, it's just specific to your CPU. Now it will execute that code, which will be just a small piece of it. And then it will jump into CRT0.s, which is setting up the C runtime. This is still assembly code, but this is a common assembly code for your architecture. Now once the C runtime is set up, the first C code can be executed. And this first C code, which is executed, lives in board underscore f.c. The board underscore f dot c means that this is a code which is supposed to be executed from Flash. And this is a bit of a legacy naming, honestly. Um, so nowadays, this is not the case, but there used to be times where 
this piece of code was running with a limited environment, usually with stack running in locked cache lines or of limited environment. Nowadays, it's running from RAM, but well, um, you should expect that sort of limitation in that environment. So this code, uh, the board underscore f code, uh, contains a list of functions which are executed in this limited environment. These functions are usually responsible for bringing up DRAM, starting it up, and ultimately when these functions finish, Uber is relocated at the end of the RAM, and the code starts uh, content in board underscore r dot u, which uh, is like the second half of the U-boot boot process, which executes functions which are running from RAM. And uh, when the board underscore r dot c completes, you will get the U-boot auto boot prompt, and then you can interrupt it and enter the U-boot shell, for example. Now, all the way at the beginning, like one of the first functions in board underscore f dot c sets up the access to the flattened device tree blob. So even at that point, so early on, like the first function in the C code allows you to access or sets up the access to the device tree. And from that on, you can extract information from the device tree blob. Um, yeah, one minor detail. If you are ever debugging the U-boot init process, take a look at the uh, lib init call.c, uh, which contains like two debug statements. And if you replace them with printf, uh, U-boot will give you a list of every single uh, init call it makes. So if you're looking for something like U-boot hangs somewhere in the middle of these init sequences, just replace them, uh, the uh, debug statements in the lib init call.c with printf and you will know which was the last init statement in those lists which still completed and where it actually therefore got stuck. It's, it's really convenient, this, this sort of debug aid there. So okay, um, now that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is um, if the device tree is compiled into U-boot because uh, U-boot is not able to read it from the file system so early on. Uh, actually, there are two ways to do it. You can embed the device tree, the flattened device tree blob into the U-boot, and it's part of a special section of the U-boot binary. This is a config OF embed. Or you can have config OS separate, which allows you to attach a device, flattened device tree blob at the end of the U-boot binary and it's not compiled into the U-boot binary, it's really just concatenated to the end. And uh, the target of this other option is that you are able to build single U-boot binary but attach different device tree blobs to it. Yeah, but it's definitely not reading it from the file system. It is one way or the other attached somehow to the U-boot binary, yes. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so let's continue. Uh, you would device tree access, right? So now that you have uh, device tree access set up uh, in the U boot uh, boot process, uh, if you grab through the U boot source trees, you will see that there are multiple ways to access the device tree. Um, this can be confusing, but uh, there are basically three ways to do it uh, using the FDT underscore functions, which uh, <clears throat> are basically the raw lib FDT calls. Uh, and you should for the most part, not use that because it just, you, you just need to code around a lot of boilerplate code if you use these functions. It could be that you need to do something special with the device tree, and in that case, you may need to use those functions, but otherwise, you probably shouldn't use them. Um, there are convenience wrappers around this, which are the FTT deck functions. Um, so these just hide the boilerplate code and allow you to conveniently extract information from the uh, control device tree. So if you are outside of the U-boot driver model, these functions might be what you want to use to extract information from the device tree. Now, if you are within the U-boot uh, driver model, you should use the def underscore functions to extract uh, information from the DT. So you see, uh, the def read functions allow you to extract information from the device tree node associated with a specific driver. And uh, if you are within that context, you should use these functions. So uh, speaking of driver model, <coughs> I uh, didn't figure out a 
good way to describe what the U-boot driver model is, but I can basically tell you where this stemmed from. So um, it was like six years ago when uh, the hardware started to become more and more complex, and U-boot at that point was still configured with a boatload of if devs, right? And uh, people started requiring stuff like, well, we have two different I2C buses using two different drivers, and uh, U-boot just doesn't have any way to support that, so we will just code this extra driver which supports our platform. And this sort of stuff started like appearing in the U-boot code base, and it just didn't scale. And it was becoming a massive mess. So uh, at uh, my university, we uh, started the U-boot driver model uh, as a sort of semestral project. And uh, ultimately, we got something going. And after that, uh, Simon Glass from Google took over and started pushing more and more of that stuff into upstream. So. Nowadays, we have a really decent but uh, a driver model without too much overhead, which is uh, fitting very well into the bootloader. Now, the U-boot driver model consists of uh, three major object types in there. Uh, first one is the U-boot classes. Now, the U-boot class is uh, sort of an interface or sort of an object which provides the U-boot as a consumer some sort of API for a specific hardware class. Uh, think of it like a serial U-boot class is providing U-boot with generic functions to uh, put character, get character, test if there is character in FIFO, uh, reconfigure about rate generator, that sort of thing. Uh, the U-boot class is also tracking driver instances. So uh, every single driver instance of that particular type that is like serial port driver instance would be registering with the serial port uh, U-boot class. So yeah, the, the other object which exists within the U-boot uh, driver model um, are driver, well, drivers, which implement a specific register poking and a specific interface for the U-boot class. This is defined uh, for each type of uh, U-boot drivers. And then there are devices or instances of drivers. So uh, uh, when you instantiate the driver, some sort of metadata get allocated, and it registers with the U-boot class. That way, you can have uh, both two different types of drivers instantiated at the same time in a running U-boot, as well as uh, two drivers of the same type instantiated at the same time while U-boot is running. And it's not a problem. If you need to select uh, which of these drivers should be used, this is configured on the U-boot um, U-class level. Right. Now, uh, the U-boot driver model core itself is designed to be massively lazy. Uh, this is because if you are booting, I mean, you want the bootloader to just initialize as little as possible of the hardware and then load the next stage, just start the next stage and get going, right? You do not want to initialize stuff which you do not need. So that's why the driver model core is designed to be really lazy. Now, uh, when the U-boot is coming up and the driver model is initializing itself, uh, the only thing which happens is that the driver model core instantiates a root driver, and that's about it. If uh, device tree control is enabled, then it scans the device tree and binds all the drivers under the root driver in the way that is described in the device tree, but it does not initialize anything at all. Um, to give you an idea how uh, the U-boot root driver and uh, all this other stuff is bound, uh, we have this convenient uh, DM3 uh, command which will list all the drivers which are bound, that means attached to the, into the U-boot uh, driver tree, as well as those that are probed. Now, um, the driver is probed, that means the hardware is initialized only when someone is first time requesting its services. That means, um, for example, if I'm loading anything from SDMMC, the first time I do any sort of block access, the SDMMC controller will get probed and initialized. And it could happen that this SDMMC controller will require, for example, clock. And then at that point, also the clock driver will be initialized for the first time. 
Now, every uh, other time when I then reuse that hardware, it is not reinitialized again. It's just initialized the first time I access it. But uh, right from the get-go, it is available to U-Boot, so it is bound, and U-Boot sees it as a device. It's just the first time it will be a little slower because the hardware needs to be initialized. Um, in this case, uh, what you see in this uh, in this picture is that serial port is actually probed because this outpad is coming out on the serial port, right? So it has to be probed and it has to be started. Um, what else do we see here? Uh, pin configuration is also uh, set up because serial port needs uh, pin configuration. It also needs clocks, so the clock are also in probed. Um, now, uh, this slide just lists what actually is available to the U-boot driver, what sort of uh, modes of operation. So, uh, yeah, U-boot driver can be bound. This is what happens by default. Um, it uh, is then probed only when uh, required. Uh, one small detail is that when you are implementing a U-boot driver, you usually do not have to implement the bind and unbind functions. There are generic implementations of those. It could only happen that if you have some sort of specific weird requirement that you will have to re-implement the bind functions. Otherwise, you can just leave them blank and uh, let U-boot just bind it using the generic code. Uh, you will have to implement probe function because this is what initializes the hardware. So there will be some register poking and so on. Uh, you should also implement the remove function. Now, remove function is responsible for shutting the hardware down before you leave U-boot. And it could happen that if you do not implement it, your hardware will do something funny when Linux is trying to reinitialize that hardware. So you should implement that. Uh, usually, <coughs> this is useful when you have like uh, USB controllers. They have some sort of built-in DMA engine. If you do not shut it down, it could happen Then when Linux restarts that controller, it will just trigger some sort of bus master access into DRAM and just corrupt DRAM. This could happen. All right, so that's pretty much it for the U-boot device tree control, driver model, and so on, the basics. And now let's take a look at how do we do uh, U-boot uh, port port. So um, if you're doing uh, any sort of new U-boot uh, board port, please start small. I mean, if you put everything <coughs> into the U-boot board port right away, you will not be able to debug it if something happens, because you will have so much complexity and so much stuff in there that it will be impossible. So start small just with, uh, I don't know, serial port out pad so that you can see that the board is doing something at all. Now, even the serial port outpad is nowadays complex enough because uh, on the modern SOCs, you need to set up like pin muxing, clock control, just to get any outpad on the serial port. Uh, but the thing is, you can kind of split this into multiple tasks. That is, um, you can pre-configure the clock and the pin muxing uh, within your board file and just focus on writing the serial port driver. Now, once you have the serial port driver implemented, you can slowly move on and implement the clock driver, then remove the uh, ad hoc clock configuration from your board file. And once you have that working, you can again write a pin control driver and remove the ad hoc uh, pin configuration from your board file. So this is what you can do. You can kind of split this task into uh, multiple. Uh, so if you are adding any sort of uh, new stuff into U-Boot, uh, there are pretty much like three things you can add. A complete architecture support, if you do that, um, that sort of stuff goes into arc slash foo. Uh, for example, arc slash MIPS would be a new MIPS architecture support. Um, if you are adding new architecture, it would be really a good idea if you also added a, at least a single board so that uh, you would can be continue the U-boot continuous integration can be done on that architecture so it doesn't start bit rotting. Now, if you are adding a uh, new board support, that will go into like board slash manufacturer name slash uh, board name. All right, and what you need to fill in there is uh, kconfig file, make file, and uh, your board file.c. Although, if you are adding a new board, the uh, board file.c should not contain anything, pretty much. It should be just a sort of like a placeholder file for the build system. Ideally, it should be empty. 
Um, all of the stuff you should be adding should just be in drivers and in device tree. Um, you will obviously need to also add a configuration uh, file, which will go into config slash your board dev config, and probably a couple of legacy uh, configuration options, which will go into uh, include configs your board dot h. Um, you also need to link the board uh, kconfig into your architecture kconfig file so that it will be a, like a single line pointing to this kconfig file in arc slash something. Um, the other thing you can add are obviously drivers, which goes into drivers. OK, so let's take a look at uh, how it looks when you add a driver. Uh, so if you want to implement the U-Boot driver model driver, you use the uh, U-Boot driver macro to define such a driver. Uh, and you give it single parameter, which is the name of the driver. Now, what this does actually behind the scenes is it generates a structure. It prefixes the, um, in this case, serial sh with a couple of extra information. But ultimately, it generates a structure which is put into a special U-Boot section alongside the other drivers. <coughs> Um, so each of these driver structures um, must have a name of the driver, which um, is different than this one, or can be different than the name of the structure. All right. um, you should come up with a sensible name, though, obviously. Uh, it has to have a U boot U class, which specifies what type of driver is this. In case of a serial port driver, it's U class serial. Um, it must have also. Uh, driver ops associated with it. Um, this has to match the U class. So these are the operations which the driver is providing to the U boot. Uh, in case of a U boot serial driver, it's like get and set character uh, and so on, this sort of stuff. I'll show you in a bit. Um, in case the driver is uh, device tree probing capable, you will have a OF match table for the device tree compatible strings. Uh, then obviously, you need to have a probe function. Um, it, Unlike the Linux kernel um, driver model, all the private um, data of the driver are pre-allocated when the driver is instantiated. So you do not, or you should not use malloc in the probe function. There is no need for that. You can just have the uh, pre-allocation of the uh, private data. Um, now, what else do we have here? <coughs> oh yeah, right. Um, in case you want to support both uh, device tree probing and all uh, platform data probing, the uh, U-Boot uh, driver model is capable of that. Actually, uh, you can provide a function which converts uh, device tree data into platform data. Again, the platform data are pre-allocated here. And uh, this is convenient, because then you can take uh, the device tree data, pre-convert them into some sort of structure, and then pass that to the bind function and the probe function. So neither of these functions has to mess with device tree at all. Um, finally, um, there is this uh, flags entry, which is just uh, saying that this is a serial port driver. It should be available early on in the boot process. Um, yeah, this is the device tree probing and how that works. Uh, so you have a table of compatible entries. Uh, that's the OF match here, similar to uh, the Linux kernel. Uh, conversion of the device tree data to platform data is implemented using this function, which uh, in this example is pulling out the register offset uh, or the base address of this platform from the device tree. And if it is valid, it is just setting it into the platform data. So this value will be available to the probe function and bind function and can use that value immediately without having to pull it from the device tree again. And yeah, the platform data are pre-allocated. So I'm just specifying in the U-Boot driver structure how much of a data I want to pre-allocate for the platform data. Now, uh, finally, the implementation of ops looks like this. Um, for the serial port, it's DM serial ops, which contain uh, get C, put C um, implementations, which uh, just get and send character over the serial port. Uh, we have... Uh, implementation of pending function, which uh, is there to uh, check whether there is a character pending in the UART FIFO. So if the UART received any character, it's like test C. And we have set BRG, which is set baud rate generator. 
And actually, all these functions have to be implemented. Here is the implementation of the, of the get C. Well, there should be a register poking in here, except it's calling a, some sort of generic function. So it's not explicitly there, but there would be some sort of uh, memory writes and memory reads in this um, function implementation. Um, also, there is one more detail. Uh, in case you need the uh, early serial, serial console, like before the driver model is running, um, you would support that through config debug UART, uh, but it's uh, quite specific. And uh, in case you are interested in that, just look up the config debug UART in, in U-Boot. It's mostly if you have like a dedicated debug UART, you can implement that. Uh, most of the platforms do not implement it. Um, this is how it looks like. If you enable this, uh, for example, on the Atheros, it implements a uh, couple of functions which explicitly init the complete uh, serial hardware and then allow you to uh, print on the uh, serial port of the debug UART directly by just poking the registers. So it's a sort of a hack-ish. <coughs> anyway, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is clock framework, which from the, implement from the driver implementation uh, point of view looks quite similar to the serial port. I mean, it just contains different uh, U-boot U-class ID and different uh, ops, which uh, contain something like enable clock, disable clock, uh, get rate, and set rate. So that's kind of boring. But uh, what uh, I would like to show you is how it looks from the consumer side. So a consumer of the clock framework is using CLK underscore functions. Um, in this case, I am, again, pulling this out from the uh, serial port driver. Uh, so what this does is, first of all, it looks up the clock based on the device tree entry in the uh, serial um, node. So if the serial node contains the FCK clock entry, it will populate um, the struct clock. Um, now, if, if this works out, we will have a valid reference to the clock driver's uh, clock handle. And we can do with that stuff like enable those clock uh, and get their rate. This is what we can do with using the clock framework. Obviously, this platform would have to have uh, implemented and instantiated clock driver. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, pin control framework, which, again, from the driver implementation point of view, is similar to the uh, serial port uh, driver, except uh, the pin control framework is kind of two frameworks in uh, one. So that might be a little confusing. Um, the pin control fr framework implements two functionalities. One of them is pin mux, which allows you to select which of the uh, blocks within the CPU gets moxed to a specific pin on the CPU package, and pin conf, which allows you to select the properties of the specific uh, CPU pin, like voltage, uh, pull up, pull down, these sort of properties. Now, all of that uh, from the consumer side is selected in like one fell swoop uh, just by uh, calling uh, pin control select state. And the way this, this whole thing looks like is that in device tree, you have multiple entries, uh, one for each possible pin configuration of a pin control group. And then uh, the driver, which is the consumer of that pin control group, just selects uh, one of these pin states. That is, um, if you call the pin control select state, it reconfigures an entire group of pins it selects the multiplexing, it selects the voltage levels, the pull-ups, pull-downs, and so on. So you do not do it on a per pin basis. OK. Um, that's pretty much it for the pin control. Um, the other frameworks, they are also quite similar. They are pretty much converted, except for writing MTD, which is uh, missing a couple of things. But in general, most of U-Boot is converted now to a uh, driver model. Uh, if there are some legacy things which are not getting converted, they will most likely soon be removed. So uh, in case you still have something which you care about in U-Boot which is not converted to uh, device tree control and driver model, now is the time to do it and submit patches. Um, but enabling uh, driver model and device tree control will make U-Boot grow up a bit, uh, possibly considerably. So. Uh, we should 
talk about reducing the size of U-boot. Um, there's one thing which is kind of orthogonal to uh, driver model and device tree control, which is U-boot SPL, uh, because this has been in for quite a while. And the U-boot SPL um, is basically a small build of U-boot, which is responsible to fit usually into an on-chip RAM, uh, initialize the DRAM, then load the U-boot and execute the U-boot in the RAM. And uh, this is especially important for systems which have some sort of size limitations. Now, the U-boot SPL can be configured in such a way that um, it doesn't have device tree control, it doesn't have driver model. These are optional in the U-boot SPL. And the U-boot SPL properties can be configured uh, separately from the main U-boot. It has like config underscore SPL options. So if you have like board dev config, you can select uh, how the SPL will look like and how the U-boot will look like. Uh, it could also happen that you will run into something called U-boot TPL, which is like ternary program loader. Um, I hope you will not run into it, but there are specific use cases where you need to strip down U-boot even further to like units of kilobytes, and this is what the TPL is for. But this is usually super board specific, and uh, you really need to know what you are doing if, if you are getting yourself into the U-boot TPL stuff. <coughs> now, I said that in the SPL you can strip out uh, the driver model and device tree control. Uh, this is possible, but uh, there are also other ways to uh, reduce the U-boot size. So on the SPL, if you use device tree control, all the nodes from the control device tree will be stripped uh, if they don't contain U-boot DM pre-relog entry. And this is to reduce the uh, um, device tree blob size. It can be quite considerably big, the device tree blob. So uh, what we do is we stripped out everything which is not needed for uh, the U-boot SPL to actually initialize itself and load the next stage this way. Um, another thing is you can completely remove the device tree control and then probe all the drivers from your board file uh, using platform data. So that's another option, because the libFTT itself is quite large in size. And yeah, this can help you reduce the U-boot size uh, a little bit further. And this is pretty much it uh, for this entire talk. Um, I should probably wrap it up, but uh, what I would suggest to you is if you're doing new U-boot talk, uh, new U-boot port, um, please use device tree control and driver model, absolutely. Um, reuse as much code as possible, so if there are drivers which you can reuse, just do that, extend them, submit patches. Um, if you have any questions, take a look into the U-Boot documentation in the doc directory. If you have uh, questions which are not answered there, or if you want to just some sort of real-time interaction with the U-Boot developers, uh, you're welcome to visit the U-Boot IRC on Freenode. Um, you're also welcome to send uh, any questions or patches to the mailing list. That would be very nice. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And do you have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. So the question is if the SPL is used typically if you need to initialize DRAM in the U-boot image. Uh, yeah, that's it pretty much. Uh, so the systems on which U-boot SPL is used are those where the boot RAM does not initialize the DRAM. You need to load some sort of small piece of code into the on-chip RAM, which does the initialization for you and then loads the next stage. And the thing I missed uh, when I spoke about the U-boot SPL is that the U-boot SPL does not necessarily have to load uh, U-boot proper. It can load uh, Linux directly as well. Uh, that's called the Falcon, mood, uh, Falcon boot mode. Thanks. Y yeah. So the question is, uh, with all the U-boot version, you have to initialize memory uh, in the board file, and if this can be placed into the device tree. Uh, this is actually platform specific, and there are platforms which do initialize uh, memory controller based on information in the device tree already. So yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
So the question is uh, how difficult it is to take a Linux driver and port it over to U-Boot. Um, that depends on which subsystem you're porting it to. Uh, the USB subsystem is trying to be held in sync with uh, Linux kernel, so at, in that subsystem it's not that difficult. You obviously need to do some sort of adjustments, uh, but in general it should not be that hard to do the porting if you have the code once. Uh, yeah, if you're starting some sort of board port, then yeah, getting the serial port running, this is the most difficult one because you have no indication from the board that it's doing anything. Uh, it depends on the, on the subsystem. Um, like I said, uh, USB is uh, good in that it's mostly in sync with Linux. Um, I believe we are now getting SPI NOR subsystem imported from Linux which uh, will be very good, then you will be able to just pull in all the SPI drivers from Linux easily. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. If I have a secure code delivered inside your group, mm -hmm. uh, at which stage does the signature check and all of that stuff happen? Uh, so the question is, uh, if you have uh, secure boot enabled in U-Boot, uh, when does the signature checking happen? Uh, well, I cannot really answer that because I don't know which uh, platform you are using. Uh, so this is kind of specific to the platform. Usually what happens is that the boot ROM on that platform is doing some sort of uh, signature check of the next stage, which would be probably the U-Boot SPL. And then the U-Boot SPL is able to continue that sort of chain of trust and verify that U-Boot has not been tampered with and move on from there to Linux and so on. So that's the uh, generic way to do it. Uh, we can talk about that later if you want. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. So right now the device tree files are in both the kernel and U-Boot and possibly other places as well. Um, is there any way to kind of uh, so the question is that the device tree files are both in the Linux kernel source tree and in the U-Boot source tree and possibly in other places. Um, and if there is any effort to actually unify them. So what happens on the U-Boot side is we are synchronizing the device tree files from the Linux kernel. And uh, yeah, ideally they should be pulled out from all these places and we should have uh, like one single repository with device trees. But I believe that's a question for the device tree masters really when this is going to happen. Well, device tree is supposed to be a stable ABI. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, on, on that um, topic, there, there are a few places where the Ubuntu bindings have um, diverged substantially from Linux. Right. Uh, any plans there? Or? Yeah, so the, the question is that there are a couple of places where the U-Boot bindings did diverge from the Linux bindings, which uh, I believe is true. Um, I wouldn't be surprised by that. What's that? Regulator. Ouch. Okay, yeah. So uh, ideally, patches are welcome. U-Boot um, <laughs> is still a community project, and uh, unless someone does the cleanup and the work, then we're not getting anywhere with that. But. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, if there is a problem in the regulator framework, it definitely should be fixed up to match uh, the Linux bindings. It has to be done. Yeah. Maybe, I, maybe that will happen already. I just didn't know if there's a general community plan or anything. Or I'll try to bring it up uh, with the regulator maintainer. Thanks for letting me know about that. Um, yeah. Uh, so the question is if uh, there is a possibility of having like multiple device tree attached to U-Boot and U-Boot can select that uh, based on some sort of pin configuration. I believe there is something like that and it's a really new feature. So it happened like very recently that U-Boot can have uh, multiple device tree attached to it. Um, 
I would grab in the device uh, in the U-boot source three four multi underscore fit or multi underscore DTB or multi image something like that, and it landed really very recently in U-boot. Yes, there is such a possibility. Uh, the other option which you could do if your boards are kind of similar to one another is uh, apply device tree overlays on the U-boot de live device tree. This is also possible nowadays with a bit of effort. So then you can kind of factor out only those changes uh, which you have specific to your different devices. Thanks. Any more questions? No more questions. So thank you very much.